Hey, listen, I got to tell you, man, man to man, this is a freaking amazing album. Oh, great. I'm glad you like it. Like, I not, I don't only like, I, I like, you know, my son walks in the room and says, who is this? I'm going, isn't this amazing? It's like, it's fresh. How do you, okay. You know what? I'm 62. You've got eight, you've got years on me. I'm trying to do the best work of my life because I'm watching the clock. That's why I'm doing it. But how do you come <laughs> up with, how do you come up with this? This sounds like a brand new band. This sounds like it's fresh. It's got energy. I mean, come on, tell me about this. It is in a way though, you know, it's like a brand new band, really, you know, because we've, it's the, it's the second album that we've done with the new singer, you know, we, we, we did Tattooed on My Brain, which was, which was a really good album. And I think we've, We've got uh, we've we've got another three years of having that line up together since then, you know, uh, and playing together. So, well, mind you, no, <laughs> for two years of that, we've been in in jail, really. Yeah, when yeah. you think about it, um, I don't know. I think um, I think um, with I think again with everybody with the writing the songs and things. I think maybe there's a bit of anger on the album just with the what's I been going you, on, you know. I think you know with the songs and writing the songs. I think people were a bit pissed off, you know, and and and, uh, and it's kind of shows. Um, yeah, it does. I mean, I've got to say that I've uh, I really enjoyed making the album. You know, it was and, and when we were doing it, I felt as if we had something. That, you know, that there's um, there's there's an album that I've really, really, really loved for for for, all, for as long as Dennis Dennis Wilson's Pacific Ocean Blue. You mm -hmm. know that the album mm -hmm. was like that, and that can I, and this album gave me that vibe that I had that, that listening to that album. I remember at the time listening to that. God, God, where did where did this come from? This is this sounds right. So you know, we, and, and that's what I feel about this one, and how you're saying about this one. And it's hard to I, I, I don't know. It just it's all the all the um, all the songs seem to gel as well. You know, they they all they all go with one another, although they're yeah. not the same as one another. And it's it's created a really good um, it's a good mood on the album. It's a lot it's a little bit dark at times, but it's heavy, you know. And and, and it's uh, and it's and it's energetic. I think that's but the thing. Waiting for the world to end. Of course, you referenced a pandemic on there, and you know that's a good thing about this because let's not avoid the fact that we've all gone through this. There's something cathartic about listening to one of my favorite artists, which you are, and I'm listening. We're going. He's living the same life on some level. He's got the same angst about this that I do. Absolutely. <laughs> That's just, uh, yeah, well, yeah. what can I say? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, how do you say your, your lead singer's name? Is it Sentence? Sentence. Yeah, just like, as in Sentence, but only okay. with an A instead of an E Sentence. Yeah. Now, like when you got him... Sentence. When you got him, you obviously didn't want a Danny, uh, 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 and and I think it's a good move. You didn't want someone that sounded like Danny. I mean, why would you want that? Because this is a singer. You don't want an imitator. Absolutely. See, the, the, one of the things that we said right away, if we were going to, if we were going to continue, which we, you know, we said, well, this is what we do. You know, this is what we're going to continue, you know. And with Dan's blessing, by the way, because he knew, you know, we should be still playing. And what, the, the first thing was we don't want a son a Dan sound alike, you know. We 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 can't do that because the fans would hate it, and they, and it wouldn't be fair on the guy that was singing as well. You know, you, you're too many comparisons, you know. So we thought what we need is somebody that can do our that's going to take our material, but you know, do it in in in, in an original way, if you like, you know, in their way, you know. And when I'll tell you what I'll, I'll tell you, John, I got a lot of. I keep saying I get tapes. You don't get tapes from people. You audition tapes, you get files, if you like, sent, you know. And I'm in, I'm getting a lot of them. I mean, there was a lot of them were Dan Soundalikes. And I've got to say, there were a lot of them very, very good. I mean, you know, they weren't, they, they, they were, they were, the guys were good. They were cool, you know. But I'm just going, no, this is wrong. You know, this is not what we're looking for. And it was a mate of mine. It was actually a drummer, a friend of mine, um, who said, you should, I said, I know what you're talking about. And there's another Scottish guy, funny enough, and he said, have you seen this guy? Take a look at this Carl Sentence guy. And I said, who's he? I've never heard of him, you know? And he said, no, well, take a look, you know? And uh, so I got into YouTube. That YouTube comes in handy sometimes. And um, and I had a look, and he, he was, uh, and I saw him with Don Airy. You know, he was out uh, with Don. From, that's a pally, hasn't he? Tours with him. And I saw him on that. And then I saw him on one of these, uh, you know, rock, classic rock shows where they had a couple of singers and they do all the big, big, 
you know, Queen's, every huge songs, everything from Sweet Home Alabama to, you know. And this guy was on this thing. He was one of the main singers on that. And I saw him in there singing all this different material from, you know, all these huge hits, but he was singing it like him. He wasn't trying to sound like, he did the thing with the Who, he didn't try to sound like Roger Daltrey. He didn't try to sound like Freddie Mercury, you know. And I thought, here, or, or, or Ian Gillen, you know, I thought, this could be the guy we're looking for. You know, this is this is what this is what we need. So we get, we, you know, got in touch and said, do you want to, do? I said, I'd love to, I'd love to have a go. So we got him to come up to Scotland, give him like four songs, learn them, you know, so let's see what you sound like. And he came up and we started playing the first, and halfway through the first song, we all just sort of went, yeah, yeah, that's it, fine, pal, you're in, you know, <laughs> you're the guy, you're the man, you know. And and it's been great. And and what was good was, what is good about it is uh, he, he, he sings, he, he, he does the Nazareth stuff very well in his own way, but he does it very well. All the all the old stuff that, you know, the, the classic Nazareth stuff, he does a good, a very good job of that. And the good thing was, is the fans accepted them very quickly. That was one of the big things, you know, we thought, mm, this is a big test because, you know, it's not just any singer that you're, you're, you're replacing him. It's Dan McAverty. I mean, he's a one-off, you know, there's the, 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 an iconic voice, you know. So, you know, we expected him to get a bit of a plaster from the, from the fans and he expected it. But we were very pleasantly surprised and the, uh, that people took to him. And he's very, very good on stage. He's got a great stage presence and things. So the whole thing just went really well. And the fact that the guy writes songs. He's a songwriter as well. So that was handy. So what you're seeing now is, uh, you know, what would have tattooed on my brain in this one, is, you know, the, 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 the sort of, as you say, it sounds like a new band. Well, it is like the new band, really, doing the new stuff, you know. And um, and I think I think because... The, the of that you get that freshness, you know, like how you approached your first and early albums. You still got that kind of energy. You're not saying, "Well, this is the 25th album." Oh dear, yawn, yawn. You know, <laughs> you're going. Well, it didn't feel like the 25th album when I went in to make it. You know, it, it, it felt um, well. It was really like the second album of this band. You know, and it was weird because you know when people make somebody makes a really good album in the early days, and they think. Oh God, can you follow that? You know, yeah. this is this is the bummer now. The next thing is, oh God, can we follow this thing? You know, especially when you get a big hit with it. Well, the thing is, we when we did uh, when we did tattoos on my brain, we thought this is a very good album. This, you know, and everybody was raving about it. We thought, hmm, you know, we could be up shit creek here, you know, because we've, we've got another one to do now. You know, I wonder if we can follow the one we've just done. And I think we did. Like, I love the last one, too. And I told you that when we talked on the phone the first time, the first interview I did with you. But there was just, yeah. like, you're right. I, I so get the fact that you do this. You go, wow, this is like, you know, sometimes everyone, artists surprise themselves all the time, saying all these pieces came together and we created this. But what was the vibe like going into, like, we were, do, we were dealing with the pandemic. Uh, did you have extra time? I mean, what was the vibe like going into it? <laughs> well, it was funny because, you know, we had too well. We had a year and a half before we, we went into the studio. And when we went into the studio, they still had all these rules and regulations over here, you know, with uh, pandemic, you know, the quarantine and, oh, God, you know, testing every day. As well, we always used to say is we actually, you know, we wrote this album in jail and we recorded it on parole. You know, that's what, that's, that's what, it, that's what it felt like, you know. And we, we, we got into the, when we got to the studio, I, I mean, the, the ah, I'll, I'll give you an example. When 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 they did the, the actual said right, that's lockdown as they called it here. You know, everybody had to stay in. Well, after about three months, about three months into it, Jimmy started sending round, and Jimmy had sent me twelve songs. I mean, twelve really good dem, really good demos as well, because he does he does very good re recordings, you know. And it was like, God, if they keep this up. By the time we get to the next album, we've got 150 tracks, you know. And it was so what was happening is people were writing like nothing, were writing like mad, you know. And so we ended up with a, a lot of material, you know, a, a, a real lot of material. And so when it came to actually record, when we got to the studio, well, actually, we'd pass stuff back and forwards to each other, you know, um, sending it and sending it back and forth to each other and trying to make some kind of decisions before we got to the studio, because normally we go to the studio with all the songs that we've got written and say, all right, play them back, 
Let's see which ones we're going to do. We could do that this time because we'd have been in the studio for a month, you know, before we recorded anything. So we tried to make some kind of choice before we got there. But we still had some like 20 songs, you know, when we went in there and saying, uh, okay, like, well, this is the... Then, then what we did is sort of started recording them and seeing which ones sounded sounded good, you know, so what, what, what sort of sounded the best, you know, and uh, and these were the ones that, that, that sort of grabbed us, but um, it was it was very exciting, and, and it was it was a weird, and then again, it was a weird album, because um, our, our, our um, producer, he's Swiss, he comes from Switzerland, and he had to come in, and he had to, you know, he had to quarantine for 10 days, and other, so, and we're going to the studio, but then our singer, Carol, he lives out near Vienna, in Austria, so if for him to come back and forward, it would have been a joke. You know, he'd have been quarantining. And everything. So what we were doing is, uh, Jimmy and Lee and me, we were in the studio with the producer, and we were recording, you know, and sending the files to Carol. And Carol was recording, because he was recording his own vocals, you know, in his own studio in, in Vienna. So that's how we did it. We never actually, we never had the four of us in the studio. Mind you, there's a lot of bands record like that anyway these All days, the you know. But, you know, that's what But we never actually... We never saw Carol until, uh, yeah, well, after the album was finished, you know. <laughs> so, not a bad track off. Not a bad track off this album. I've got to say, that I love the way that you end with a blues song, which is the slowest tune. But I mean, I love the way you start it with like Strange Days, straight ahead rocker, which indeed uh, we do live in strange days. But I'm going, the the uh, the the pacing on this album, you know, the how, how, from one song to the, you, you've referenced that a while ago, the fact that they all sound, they all have their own personalities, but they're all part of the same family. And it just works. Not a bad track. And it's rare when I say that. That's great. It's great. But I said, you know what? It's, it's funny. Somebody said to me, uh, it was last week, it was one, the guy, that the uh, Keith, the guy that kind of runs our website and stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, I said, it's really good. It's on, uh, it's on uh, iTunes. He said, you know, you can, they're advertising it on iTunes now, you know, and, and you know how they give you the little circle and you can play like a minute and uh, yeah. but whatever it is, you know. And I thought, here, this is great. So I went, of course, they've got them in different orders. They changed the order already. But I thought, this is a good way to dig the album if you don't want to play. Like. So I got it on iTunes and I was going, so I got it on iTunes and I was going, now, if I was a person just having a look at this album and I don't know it, this is how they would hear it, you know. So I thought, right, I'll do this. So I was playing it, and I'm getting. I think, well, I like that track. And then going to the next, track, I thought, and so I was, I was really enjoying it. And I thought, hey, this is the way I'm going to listen to my album after this. You know, <laughs> get a minute and a half. You know, that's good. Yeah, that's great. You know, so it was really great. And when I was listening to it, I thought, you know, listening to it, I thought, yeah, these, these are. This is a good album. It's a good, it's a good mixture of songs. You know, without um, being, you know, there's nothing on there that feels as if it shouldn't. It's. It shouldn't be there. It, 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 like, it, it, you know, I mean, okay, you know, when when I did, when I wrote, um, you know, um, uh, you you moved me, you made me. Obviously, I, I wrote that and I sung that, you know, and and that was well, it was my twenty fifth album, you know. Pete's going to get a song on it, and you're going to where are you going to put it? Well, you're going to put it at the end because you could not put that in the middle of a a big rock album, but you can you know say goodbye with it, you know. But other than that, the other thirteen tracks really, really. You know, match if you like. You know, they're, they're, although they they're different, but they match. They 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 add up to making that that great vibe. I think. I think you know. I I like phrasing. I, I like artists. You know, I like Sam Cooke because of his phrasing. But you know, the, the Carl does this thing on "Better Leave It Out." There's this like phrasing where he, I'm going, how did he put all those words in there? And it seems to really work and it bounces, which good phrasing should do. And you know, I'm going like, oh my god, this guy. You like. He's got this power, but but to be a rock singer and to phrase at that level with a song like that, I just go, I, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. <laughs> <laughs> he was, he has, that's a good song that one. That was one of Jimmy's songs, yeah. And that's, and and that's uh, and it's quite a it's, it's quite a tricky thing to sing and get weight into it as well, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was good. I mean, actually, Carl Carl was, uh, was uh, you know we stretch him, you know, because everybody writes differently. You know, you can tell the songs that Carl writes. You know, when he's uh, the, he he's on very much a straightforward rocker. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he, he likes his heavy metal. You know, and, and 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 so, but Jimmy writes and Lee write differently. You know, and Jimmy's got like a lot of little tricky kind of things he does. His songs, you know, and the the, the you know you you need to think about it. You know, when you're singing them, you know, you need to work at it. 
And Carol does it wonderfully. You know, he, he, uh, he's, he's, he's made a great job of every, every song on the album, actually. It's very good. And uh, Let the Whiskey Flow, great guitar riff. Man, I just, <clears throat> from Jimmy, I love that so much. Like, I went back and I listened to it again before listening to the next song. I mean, that's, you know, I haven't done that in years where I have a song and I go, yeah, I got to hear it again. Uh, you know? <laughs> and that was one of Lee's, he wrote, what, he wrote that one. What, what, that's, his, that's his Scottish nationalist song. That's his, that's his <laughs> pissed off against the government song. <laughs> I don't, actually, I don't agree with every one of it, but it's good. <laughs> who, are the, who are the bass players that kind of changed the way you play? When you were getting up there, when you started with that instrument, uh, there must've been people that, that you kind of changed the trajectory of how you play. Who were those? No, nah, man, you know, you know, some of John, I never really think like a bit, I've never thought like a bass player. I'm, I'm in a, I used to play guitar. I played the rhythm guitar and, and that's how I started. And I started the band when my early days, when I started the band that eventually became Nazareth. But I was like, the, I was always, I was a lead singer in the band and, and, I, and I played rhythm guitar. And then eventually, Dan and I, when we got Dan and many years later, we had a kind of twin vocal thing. And I kind of stopped playing guitar. And we just, we were doing, a, it was really like a Scottish soul band thing. That's what we had, you know. And that's what we had for years. And then when it came, what happened was uh, when we, we fired the bass player that we had because he was just never showing up. And I used to have to play bass on the stage, maybe for the first two or three songs until he used to turn up, you know, at the gigs. So when... When we got rid of them, they said, right, we need to get a bass player. And I thought, well, they said, well, what about you? You play it. I said, oh, I don't know, man. And I said, oh, come on. You know, there was nobody else that we sort of fancied in the town. And, you know, the guys were going, you know, I'm thinking, well, there's only four strings, so it can't be that hard. You know, so well, I'll give it a go. Why not? You know, so but the thing is, I always played the bass like I was playing a rhythm guitar. You know, when I've, I've always played with a pick for a start. I mean, now and again, a little slow song, I'll play with my fingers. But generally... I've always been a pick player. It's funny, actually. I play the bass with a pick. When I'm playing a six-string guitar, I play it with my fingers. <laughs> do it the wrong way around. But anyway, I, I, I can play with a pick, and I play rhythmically, very I, I, like, a rhythm, like playing rhythm guitar almost. So uh, when I think, when I play bass lines, it's, um, it's more like a, a guitar player would play it rather than a bass player would play it, you know? And, I, and I, you, you'll hear that in... You hear that in, uh, in, in Strange Days, for instance, you know, there's like, there's kicks come in there because it's upstrokes on the pick that, you know, really shouldn't be there. But that's the way I play, you know. So I've never really had bass players that I've, I've said, oh, I, I must I must listen to this guy. Or, or I, I mean, I hear guys, obviously. And I mean, there's there's guys that have been the pals of mine that, are, that I've played with that I admire, you know, that, uh, as bass players. But I've never wanted to be like anybody in, in particular, you know? No, really, no. I don't really think about it. To tell you the truth, I'm, I'm sitting looking at it here. It's sitting on its stand uh, over here. And the, we played a gig in uh, in January there. And I've never had this thing on since then. You know, so I don't, <laughs> I sit and play the guitar at home and I sit and record it, but I never play the bass. And just, when we're going to go back in the road, I think, right, it's time to get, time to get the boy on again. Time to get the bit of wood, the heavy, the heavy guitar on again. You mentioned so. Strain Days. Uh, uh, you know, to me, I don't remember the last time I, I listened. I know we've talked about it already. I remember the last time I heard an album where I'm going, now that's the opening track. Because, you know, growing up in the 70s, everyone had a kick-ass first song, right? It was Whether it was a single uh, or not, it was always the kick-ass, like, you better pay attention to me, the yeah. album sang, right? There was no there was no choice on that album, right? When, that, when, when, when we did Strange Days, and, you know, we always used to, you know, when you're doing an album, you're recording, okay, what are we going to use to open? Uh, yeah, there was never any question about what was going to be the opener on that one, you know. It just goes bang, you know. It's, just, it's, a, it's a great track. It's a great song. I really, really, uh, it's one of the, one of my favourite Nazareth tracks of, yeah. of all time, really. Yeah. In 1975, it's amazing that, uh, you know, I was 15 years old when this was, was everyone was talking about, especially, I mean, I'm, I'm in Canada. Uh, when the first time we talked, I was in Calgary. Now we moved across the country to Moncton, New Brunswick, where I'm from. And I remember, you know, being here in, in New Brunswick back then. And when Hair of the Dog came out, it's kind of like one of those things. If you didn't like Nazareth, you had no choice. Now you had to like Nazareth, no matter what, even though I love Razmanez a lot and the stuff that came before it. But um, what, what, what was it? It was like, the, it's like you guys were in the, in, in the perfect storm of everything, like having two huge songs, the title song and love hurts. 
Uh, is there an explanation for it or is it just like good timing or you were in the groove? What, what, how do you look back at 75, for instance? No, the whole album was an accident. I mean, that, 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 that hit was an accident. It was an accident. I mean, the whole was an accident because what happened is we did, when we did, uh, when we did Hair of the, what they call Hair of the Dog, come on, let's face it, it's called Son of a Play. That's yeah. what, that was the name of the track. And we were calling it that. And then when we, when we went to, to A&M with the album title, they went, oh, man, Sears won't sell it. You can't, you can't call it that. And we thought, what do you mean? Because you see where we come from in Britain, Son of a bitch isn't a word, that, and that's not a, that's not a, a nobody uses that. It's not a saying. It, it means nothing. It's a thing that John Wayne says. You know, as far as we were concerned, we thought, well, if John Wayne says it, it must be holy. It can, you know, it must be. You know. Anyway, we were told we couldn't call the album that, so we said, okay. So we were going to call it Air of the Dog. You know, just to be cheeky, and then and then we thought, all right. So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> we can, I've, I've, I did a, to clear my throat here. I've got a, <coughs> I had COVID and I've got rid of it. And I've still got a bit of cough. You had anyway, it? You had COVID? Yeah, yeah. I, I, it was no big deal. It was, okay. but it's, it's gone now. Just got a bit of cough lingering on. Anyway, back to the, I, 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 I digress. What happened was um, the, the, the hair of the dog thing, we called it hair of the dog, right? That was fine. Now that track, uh, when, so when, when we gave the album to AM, Love Hurts wasn't on that album. It was only on 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 the albums everywhere else in the world. The song, the slow one, it was on was called "Guilty." The one, a song by Randy Newman. If you see all the other copies, that's what's on that. Not the the North American one, the, the American one. The, the Jerry Moss heard he heard Love Hurts. They said, "I'm putting that on the album because this is this is the one I like." So thank God that he did, right? And uh, so that went on the album. And uh, what happened was when it was getting played. You know, uh, it was always the AM stations would play that, but would, they would never have played Hair of the Dog, Son of a Bitch. No way. But what happened is all the, all the you had at that time, you had all the college stations at that time. And they were great, the college stations. Of course, when this this Love Hurts thing came out, and they heard, on the, 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 they heard this other thing, the Son of a went, ah, you know the one we're going to play. So they started playing that all the time. So that's how that became a hit. That would never, ever have been a hit. If Love Hurts hadn't been on there in the first place, for people to hear that album, yeah. that other one would never have been a hit on its own. It would never have been a hit, you know? So that was absolutely, and it was an accident. The album being, and, and, and even, it's so funny, Love Hurts was an accident because the whole thing is really, it's the, it's the jammiest thing that ever happened to us, that album, you know? Because when we did Love Hurts, we did it as a B-side. And what happened is when we recorded it, Dan and I we were in the studio. Dan and I went away for a day to a wedding up in Scotland. We flew up to a wedding. And while we were away, Mary and Daryl stuck down the back track. We used to listen to uh, Graham Parsons and Emmy Lou Harris singing uh, the, on the Grievous Angel album. We mm -hmm. used to listen to Love Hurts when we were driving around. And, and we always used to like it when through the night driving in the, the van and things. And we thought, oh, we'll do that as a B-side, you know, to, for one of the next single that comes out. So they recorded it, but they recorded it in the same key. When we come back, they said, oh, we recorded it. And I went, I'll stick a bass on it, right? So I went and stuck a bass on it, and it said, oh, that sounds okay. So we were going to do it with Dan and me singing it like them, you know, like the Everly Brothers thing, with a harmony mm -hmm. and stuff. So Dan went in to sing it, and it was like, no, oh, this is, this. it's too low. It just didn't sound, you know, didn't it did nothing for his voice. So we thought, nah, we'll just leave that. If we had have been there, we'd have recorded it in a different key because Dan and I would have went, no, nah, the vocal doesn't sound good there. We'd have, we'd, we'd have changed the key so we could have sung it together. But so it happens. So anyway, Dan went, I'll tell you what, I'll just let me try singing it on the octave. So he went in and he started singing it the octave up, you know, from, and we went, well, the best of luck, pal, because when you get to the minute, you know, the middle, you know, you're just going <laughs> to, you'll blow your back teeth out. So we're just, I, I was sitting waiting to have a laugh, you know. And he sung this thing, and it was, I mean, I was there. I saw this happen, you know, and I saw this vocal taking place. And it was just, it just blew us away. It was just unbelievable. This vocal, it just, my God. I mean, it's just one of the best vocals ever. And he did that, and that would never have been sung like that if that, that hadn't been done in really the wrong key. So between that being in the wrong key, that thing not being on the album in the first place getting put on there, and here of the dog, the son of a bitch, being heard because of that, there you go. 
stick it on the big mixing pot. And that, that became the biggest album in North America. But the whole thing was completely by, not by design, let me tell you. When we went in to record that, we didn't think, well, here you go, we've got this great album. Well, we thought we had a good album, but we didn't think this is the one it's going to do. You see, you've got to remember that, you know, in America, they talk about that one because that was the first hit in there. That was the, we never had any hits in America. We'd hits all over the world. All over the world with Razamanaz, Loud and Proud, Rampant. All these albums had done really, we had gold albums and platinum albums for them, but we couldn't, we couldn't get arrested in the United States, you know? And then, and when that album, that was the one that broke through there. Now, if, if I'd have looked at all the albums we had and said, which one is going to crack it in the States? I wouldn't have picked that. You know, I'd have thought, Razamanaz, Loud and Proud, you know, but um, that was the one that did it. And all it did it with a, this lovely song called Love Hurts and a wee sweary word at the other end, and there you go, what a way. And you know what's so funny about it, John? You know, when you think about it, eh, the, you can't say it. Can you imagine now, these days, saying to them, oh, I'm sorry we can't put your album because you said son of a... <laughs> <laughs> these days, it would say, you put that in a hymn. I just I just talked to Robert Lawson, who of course, wrote a book on the Nazareth uh, tunes. Uh, uh, I think he, he probably interviewed you for that book, didn't he not? Yeah, I've, yeah. I've, 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 I've talked to Robert a few times. Uh, well, I asked him because of the book. I said, OK, Robert, I'm talking to Pete uh, next week. He, I said, give me a juicy question. He says, well, you might want to ask him about the an album that was uh, Dan. It sounded like a Dan solo album where the band's not really playing on it and i wasn't familiar what album is he talking about that the that that's first well he did two he did uh, but this uh, one's he, under nazareth this one is under nazareth oh but, that's that's um, um um snakes and ladders yes yes Sna snakes and ladders i mean what I happened there really, i don't really consider that like a nazareth album almost because we're hardly i mean i play in a couple of tracks and manny plays in a few what what happened is with the 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 German record phonogram, they got a producer and an American guy, and to produce it. And I mean, basically, the the I think the guy wanted to make a Dan solo album. He was a big Dan fan, you know, and I think he had a he had it in his mind how he wanted the thing to sound, but he was he, he wasn't thinking, you know, <laughs> about how we played. It was more like how just to surround Dan, and we just never. Um, we never really clicked in the studio, you know, with the with the guy. So they ended up getting. Uh, well, it started off with um, all the drums were, you know, um, programmed. Yeah. They were all programmed, you know. And actually, it was Manny Elias that, that came in. Manny was the drummer with Tears for Fears. The guy is a really nice guy. He played with Tears for Fears, and uh, but but well, he he was programming drums for a lot of sessions at that time. So he came in and he programmed the whole thing. And then uh, when, when we started, we were doing things, we were laying down things, uh, track, you know, instrument by instrument. And I played in a couple of, uh, a couple of the tracks. I actually played in the one that was the, the, big, the big hit from it was uh, We Are Animals, which became a monster in, in Russia. That, well, I actually played on that one. So they must have wanted to hear Nazareth over there. <laughs> and so we, we played a couple of tracks and, and it wasn't really working out with this, the producer and myself, you know. So he got this, he got this another bass player, and and uh, so fair enough, I can go home here. Then Dad, Manny went in and played a few things, and he wasn't really getting on long too well with him. So he got another guitar player in. So um, so it ended up that it was really just Dan uh, in the studio on his own um, singing, you know, with, with with a guy. So it was the, the whole album was kind of. It just kind of passed me by. I don't. I don't really think of it as. A, I don't really think of it as a Nazareth album. You know, it's, it's one of these weird ones. And it was one of the albums where we did. Uh, I mean, the guy had uh, things he'd like to. Cut. You know that you get songs. Yeah, there are songs that should never be touched. You know, they're holy. The holy grail. You yeah. know, the things that are just. You just don't. River deep, mountain high. Don't do it. You know, there is only one river deep. I don't care who you are. Or how fantastic you think you are. Don't touch it. It's like, well, peace in my heart with Janice Joplin. I mean, give me a break here, you know? It's peace in my heart. So the guy wanted to do peace in my heart. And the other one, helpless. I mean, helpless. Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. I mean, you know, that's a, that's a tough one to follow. So these two things that should never have been covered by anyone 
uh, was two of the favourites of this man to do. So we didn't really see eye to eye, really. You know, as you, you, as you can tell, you know. So it was just one of these albums that, um, I, you know, I say I've done 25 studio albums, but probably I've only done 24 when you come to go. <laughs> <laughs> I know it was quite funny, John, because what happened was with that album, um, Manny and I play, there's, there's, there's only two tracks I think I play with on the thing. I sung on a lot of the tracks and a lot of singing and stuff like that. But but we did uh, the one and, and they released this song, this uh, Animals, it's called. And it became, I mean, you guys in America and, and Canada, it means nothing over here, but in Eastern, in the Eastern world, right? Mm-hmm. Eastern Europe, Russia, the biggest country in the world, this thing is like an anthem, you know? It's the biggest Nazareth track. It, we are animal. I mean, it's a great number. I mean, it's a it's a great it's a great number. I mean, it's a killer killer number. It's a killer track. But uh, you should play it. You you. I mean, if you've never heard it, you will like it. <laughs> it's like, I'm and, not uh, sure. I'm not sure. I, 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 of course, after this, I will. Animals. It's it's and and in, in Russia, the absolute. What happened is we made what to make a a a, a video, and it, and we were going to do Russia for the very first time. Mm-hmm. Big band coming in to play Russia, and they're doing this one video of us, and it was that song, and they put it all over Russia. It was on their TV all the time, right before we got there. So by the time we got there, this thing was a monster, and we didn't even play it. We had to, we had to, we had to learn it when we got there, so we could. And of course, then we started playing it, and you couldn't hear us for all the crowd singing it, you know, because it was so. <laughs> so it became a monster. So it was always I always said that in Snakes and Ladders. The producer, you know, the, if he hasn't listened to it, the track that became the monster track was the one where we actually play with Nazareth. <laughs> it's the one where we actually all play together. So there you go. So there must be a... There's the, there's the, tell, tell them about that. That's my... Melody, she's from Saskatchewan. She says, what's your favorite of all the Nazareth? You can't count the first one because we're because everyone says their new album is good. So don't you dare, buddy, even no, though I no. love your new album. What, what, what is, when you look back, what's, uh, you, what are some of the favorites of yours? Now, you see, that this is the real thing, you know, and I'll have a bit says that, you know, what, you know, what, What's your what's your funniest story? What's your what's your favorite what's your favorite country? I mean, who's going to answer that? <laughs> what's <laughs> your favorite you, dream? Uh, Pete, what's your favorite? You if some, you were a tree, what tree would you be? <laughs> uh, unless you've got some serious death wish, you're not going to tell what's the favorite country. You know, uh, uh, you know, you know. Hello, I love playing in you know I love playing in Canada. You go to Detroit and get shot. You know, so no, what's happening is uh, with the same way same albums. I don't know. I don't know. I've, I, I don't have favorite albums. I have I've tracks on each album that I like. You know that kind of thing. You know, and and you know what happens is sometimes the, the closest I can say to Melanie is now and again somebody will mention a track and I think, oh, I've never heard that song for a while, and I'll I'll, I'll dig it out, you know, and I play like uh, I'll play the track, and then I, t- I, I listen to the next track on that album, and I think, yeah, this is good. This, and then I start to play, and I think, well, this was a good album. So I start to play it and I think, oh, I like, I'm, I'm enjoying this. So that becomes my favorite album for a week, you know, and then, and then maybe some other time there's another track. Now, oh, I'll check that one. It was, and it was funny actually. Last, just a couple of days ago, there it was somebody was mentioned something from, what was it? it was a, it was it was a move me. We did that song called Move Me, and it was on the Move Me album. And I thought I'm going to have a listen to that again. And I listened. So I ended up playing. I was sitting with the headphones on. I ended up playing the whole album. And I thought. Yeah, this is a great album. Let's play it all again, you know. So that was my favorite <laughs> album. Last, two days ago, Move Me was my favorite album, you know. So I don't really, I, you know, I don't really have one. But um, I mean, I, I don't, obviously, I don't, I, I don't love everything we've done. And nobody does. There's nobody in any band who says, oh, I've loved every track I've played. That's rubbish. You know, you don't. You know, there's, there's times you go like, oh, well, the rest of them want to play it. You know, uh, you do your best, you know, and try and, Try and get it as good as you can, you know. But I mean, there's there's not. But then again, there's nothing I've really hated to play. You know what I mean? Because we just wouldn't do that to each other. You know, you wouldn't make somebody play something. They say, "Look, I think this song sucks." You know, well, well, we're not going to do it then. You know. So I've always kind of liked everything we've done. You know. Scott asked. He says, "You know, I I get a feeling that Pete has." never ending music in his head. He says, is that why he continues doing it? You're the last remaining member of that classic lineup. At the same time, you've got this band that seems to be on fire. Why Pete Agnew, do you continue doing it now? 
Oh, this is because this is what I do, really, is the, is the simple answer. Is this, this, this is what I do. I mean, music is, has been my whole life. And, and ever since I was very, very young, I mean, since, I mean, I, in my first, I was 11 in my first band, you know, and, mm. and, and, that's, and that's all I ever really wanted to do, you know. So, and you just, I mean, nobody, you don't really, you've noticed nobody really retires in this game. You die, you know, you just, at some point, somebody doesn't make it to the next gig. Well, that'll be me, you know. That'll be, you know, there's all the gigs are up there in the sheet. You just hope you make them all. And there'll be one that I won't. And that'll be it. That'll be all gone. But, I mean, there's nothing makes you do it. You know, it's just, it's, uh, it's uh, I'm not saying that, you know, I, I, I completely, I'm looking forward to uh, every every gig. You know, there's some nights I would gladly pay somebody three times the fee so as I could stay in the hotel. I mean, that happens, but that happens to everybody in any job they're doing. But most of the time, I'm really, really happy to be on the stage and to play. You know, it's a, a, I do enjoy playing. Uh, April, I'm doing a thing on April Wine. I know you guys have... Uh, oh, have, aye, aye. I, I, yeah, I know. Um, and and I, think, I think I told you the first time, it, like you'd remember, it's been a long time. But he said, uh, I remember... Um, I think it was Brian Greenway had told me, he says, you know, when we lost Daryl, it was just a, a sad thing. And you know, he was talking as if it was like his drummer, you know, but, uh, uh, but to, 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 to focus on April wine, do you have any good memories of, uh, cause I'm going to include this in my April wine one hour special. Oh, I, well, you're I mean, on the spot. Wow. Well, I mean, the mall, but Brian and, and, and Miles and, and, and Jerry, you know, like, I mean, we're, um, I saw Jerry. Well, actually I saw, I saw the boys. Uh, we did a, uh, we did one at that rock cruise thing. There's a rock cruise, the uh, Legends Cruise, they call it. And we did the last one just before the before the lockdown thing. That was the last one. And and April Wine were on that. So we were kind of hanging, well, Miles and I were hanging out on that for a, for a bit, you know. It, it was one of these um, things, you know, you went along to see them and they come along to see you and, you know, and that that kind of thing. You could, it was, it was good fun, actually. So no, the, but the, the guys were good. And, and actually, uh, Jerry was one of my favourite drummers of all time. I mean, when when he was playing with them, he was an amazing, amazing drummer. Now we used to when, when we did a tour. One of the one of the big coast to coast tours we did in Canada was with April Wine. Was we, we came we came with us, you know, and they well, I say they were the opening band, but I mean it was a it was a, a Bill Nazareth and April Wine, you know, it was it was you know that you couldn't just it wasn't a support band. You know, I mean, it was. It was two really good bands. It was a great, it was a great bill. And, that's a, uh, that's an a, ultimate uh, lineup to me. That's an ultimate lineup. Oh, it was, it was, it was a great tour. It was a great tour. And I mean, there was more. Oh, I mean, uh, there was more nonsense. Got, got oh, I mean, I, I couldn't begin. I, I, actually, I better not say too much because I'm sure that <laughs> it depends on the statute of limitations. But I think we could still go to jail for some of the stuff that happened on that tour. So I better not say too much. We did have a lot of fun. Too much fun, I think. And I think that was I, a while ago. But I understand. I, I always look at Miles. A April Wine's my favorite Canadian band, and and I always, you know, I know Miles got a lot of accolades, but still. There was always a bigger, like a rush in front of them. It's like I was always mad watching, you know, our Canadian Grammys or Junos. And I was always going for the band because I think Miles is a musical genius. I think he's just I, under I used to like, I like Miles' stories in between the songs as well. You know, yeah. he, used to, he, used, he used to tell a good tale. You know, he had a, uh, uh, he, he did make me laugh, I've got to say. But uh, oh, they're a great band. I mean, they're a really, really good band. And, and uh, it's still, still banging away as well. They were, they were I mean, on that tour. Uh, they were when I saw them, you know, and I went into. I said, it's funny because we were due on the stage. It was one of these things, you know. They've got different bits. They were in the theatre, and I think we were playing on the deck or whatever it was, you know. And they've always got bands on at the same time, so they were on. You know, it's about the only time I could see them. So I managed to get to see like fifteen minutes of them before I had to run away and start our set, you know. But it was at the other end of the ship, you know, one of these deals. And they come on that that night, and they, they were absolutely wonderful. I mean, and I, I, hadn't, I hadn't heard them for, oh, it had been years since I'd seen them, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, they sounded, they were fabulous. They were really great. So they're a great band, great band. Okay, I'm going to, uh, I, I like to, you seem like a really good sport. So I'm going to, I'm going to see if I can ask you. These are 10 questions. There's quick answers. If you want to pass, pass. But, but, but. 10 I just, questions. Uh, 10 questions. Or, listen, you can say yes or no, or pass, or you can say, but I'm I, okay. I'm gonna start. Is that okay? Yeah. Well, I'm, you'll I'm, have you'll you'll love it. It'll be fun. Trust me. Right. In high school, 
In high school, were you known as a music guy? Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, was, I, I, I used to take the, the guitar to school at the end of term, entertain the troops, you know. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah, known for that, definitely. Beatles or Stones or both? I, well, I was never a, I, I, this. I wasn't a big pop fan at the best of times, but the the Stones have, have been the Stones were the, the 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 person that we covered more of their songs than Beatles songs. I'm not surprised you said that. I I you know what? I never thought of it till you answered. No, but of course. I, 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 Outside of music, what are you best at? I'm sorry. Outside of music, what are you really good at? Like, can you cook? Because there's something you're really really quite good at. I just want people to get a different side of you. I don't know. I was going to say bullshit, but I was going to say you do that in music. Uh, um, <laughs> I don't, you know, the thing is, there isn't really any outside of music for me. You know, it's like it takes up my entire life. I'm very good. I'm very good at booking flights for bands. Put it that way. I'm, you do I that? Be, could, Are you the guy who does be, that? I, I could be an excellent, yeah, because I hate travel agents because they're hopeless. So I, I, I'm, I, I do my own travel agency. I could be a travel agent. There you go. I could be a travel agent. <laughs> well, did you, did your parents get what you were doing when you got into music? Did they get it? Yeah, definitely. My, 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 my folks were very, very big music fans, you know, and 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 they loved, uh, they loved everything. I've, uh, you know, they encouraged me all the way ever since my first guitar, and yeah. You know what? That, that I love hearing that because you know, as uh, as you can imagine, I don't get that very oh, often. I mean, my, 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 my mother thought Elvis Presley was just unbelievable. She thought that was uh, she she liked Elvis. <laughs> Is there still someone out there that you'd like to meet, like you haven't met, or are you even starstruck at all? Does that even I- enter your mind? Yeah, well, the, I mean, uh, no, I mean, no, really, no, no. I mean, the the, the people that are, that I like are. Were, were writers mainly a, a lot of stuff. I mean, I I met P.G. O'Rourke once, and I was that was the big the big thing for me. He's one of the best writers, and he just died there recently. So I'm yeah. glad I got a chance to meet him. Yeah, yeah. But if, people might have told you you seem really grounded, and you seem like unapologetically like, you, like you're Pete Agnew. You don't have to. You don't like. There's just something, something about when I talk to you, and then as you can imagine, I talk to someone every day, and I've been doing this 39 <laughs> years. But you seem comfortable in your skin. Well, I mean, there was, you know, this, we come we come from a, 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 a small town here, you know. I mean, I still live, we still live in, uh, in at home, you know, in, in Scotland. Yeah. I mean, Dan Dan's five minutes from me, you know. He lives in a village next door, and we've lived in these villages for since we were kids, you know. So we we're at home. Um, I mean, there was a, for instance, there was a big, there was a great big thing in the local newspaper. There was a big story about me last week. You had a whole page all about, you know, the we, sh- we should have been in Russia. and you could, In fact, I should have been playing in Kiev tonight. We should have been playing there. And we should be playing Kharkiv tomorrow. And we should have just come from Russia. So there was a big story about us being in Russia and blah, 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 in the paper, you know. And and, and so in big progress. So, so where I am, I'm not a big rock star here. I'm Pete Agnew. It's just in the local paper, you know. It's you know they see me in the pub, you know. So it's. Uh... I think I think fans fans love hearing stuff like that because they you know they 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 everyone wants to know oh oh people say why don't you get nervous doing interviews I'm going well they go to the bathroom just like I do I mean I just oh, love their job. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's you know, like I say, we 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 grew up. We 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 stayed in the town. That we were pretty much in the town, the villages around the town that we were yeah. born in. I mean, at the time when we were when we were hitting the sort of the high spots, if you like, oh, you should move to London and you should move to LA and you should move here and and the, and to tell you the truth, if we had made any moves, I probably would have been Canada because I mean we were more comfortable there than any place else. You know? And I've got to say that uh, I've had oh I've had many a hangover in Toronto. I've got to say. <laughs> But then again, I've had many a Hanover and Winnipeg and Montreal and Vancouver, <laughs> Grand Prairie, you name it, Regina. Rizzo, um, and no, no, loves you. <laughs> the beer is free here, my friend. Hey, have you ever, uh, uh, were you ever allowed to splurge 
being in Nazareth? Because like, you know, David Pack from from a player said, well, I said, yeah, I, I bought a I bought a Porsche. But were you ever that type of guy? You got a big check and you've splurred? I did. Yeah, you know, you know, I was never into buying toys, but it was one time. I remember when, when I was about 14 years old, I saw this car in the, in the high street in Dunfermline. It was a Morgan. And I remember seeing this and thought, I'd love one of them. It looks an incredible thing. So when when we sort of hit it big, I was up in the, uh, we lived out in Isle of Man for a while. And Manny phoned me up and he said, listen, there's a Morgan, a big, a red Morgan, plus eight up in the garage up there. And I said, it's, and the guy said, they're selling it up there second hand. It's only done 500 miles. And I thought, I had a look at this thing. I thought, oh, it's unbelievable. So I said to my wife, she said, buy it. She says, go and get it. She said, because you've never, you never ever bought yourself anything like that. Just go and get a toy. And I thought, ah, well, why not? I'll get this thing. So I got it and I drove it for about a year, but not very much because we were traveling a lot. Yeah. And then I damn near killed myself in it. So uh, I had done two and a half thousand miles and I sold it. And that was my last, my first and last toy. And, and, and uh, I never bothered after that, you know. So, so I've never really, I've never really, really, you know, um, um, splurged it on things, you know, like. You're practical. Uh, no, I tell you what, I like, I, mean, I like, I like to, I mean, I live quite well. I mean, I, I like to be able to go where I like and, and, and to, I mean, to, to go where, to, I like going to restaurants and stuff like that, but that's the kind of things that I think that I've, I've, I've well, I've earned, I've earned it anyway, yeah. you know, but that's the kind of things I like. I've never been, you know, one, oh, I must buy a, I must buy a, a villa in some place, you know, it's never, Never bother me. If I'm going to go on holiday, I'll go there for a couple of weeks. I don't want to buy someplace and live there. You know, just I'll go there and come back to Scotland again. I'm completely like you. I, whatever what you just said, I, I, I that's how I live my life. Out. Um, um, oh, hold on, hold on. That's three more for you. Then I'm gonna let you go, and you'll be free from me. What's the craziest thing? Uh, Actually, after- you're saying you know you know how free I'm going to be. I'm going to be free for another seven minutes because there's another interview starts at six o'clock okay. at the radio station. I'm, I'm really fast. Uh, what, uh, as, a, as a Nazareth fan ever done anything? What's the craziest thing a Nazareth fan has ever done? We'll stop with that one. Nazareth fan. I think one of the, the, one of the things was a, a, a woman in, uh, in, in Russia, in Tomsk. She was a, re- a DJ in the 70s. And she got the rampant album. You got to remember that rock and roll was banned in Russia yeah. at that time. They couldn't play it on the radio or anything. She was a DJ <coughs> in a radio station. <coughs> and Tom's <coughs> excuse me. And uh, she 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 locked all the doors in the radio station. She went downstairs and locked the outside doors. She barricaded herself in. And she played the whole of the first side of the rampant album before the police managed to break down all the doors and get in and arrest her. And she went to jail for two months. And uh, and she she I mean, we got told this while we were doing a press conference there. There were about 200 press people. They were killing themselves laughing when they told us, when the interpreters told us what she'd done. We couldn't believe it. And that was a Nazareth fan. I think that's a pretty crazy thing to do. She could have she could have easily got 10 years, you know, yeah. but she got two. She went to jail for us, just just to play us. So best was- best story of uh, for that question. 